This is my Power Macintosh 7300-200, a beige desktop from 1997 that sits right at the end of Apple's old world era. Inside is a PowerPC 604E processor manufactured by IBM. It was introduced alongside the Power Macintosh 8600 and 9600, which were considered to be serious hardware. But with the multi-gigahertz CPUs of today, its 200 megahertz isn't going to get anyone excited, and you could say it could use some help. So in this video, I'm going to swap the processor with a 400 megahertz G3. We'll run some benchmarks and compare the CPU and some tests in Photoshop. And of course, we can't just leave it there, and we're going to try something a little weird. I'm going to try running BOS on it, an operating system that shouldn't even boot on a G3. We'll see how it performs, talk about why BOS never supported Apple's later machines, and take a trip back in time when the future of the Mac looked very uncertain. Right after a quick message from our sponsor, PCBWay. Are you ready to bring your next idea to life? Whether you're working on PCB prototyping or fully assembled, rigid or flexible boards, CNC machining, injection moulding or even 3D printing services, PCBWay has you covered. Just upload your design to their website and they'll handle everything with incredible speed and precision. I've personally used their 3D printing services and honestly it's fantastic. You can choose from a huge range of materials and the quality is seriously impressive. So if you're ready to take your project to the next level, head over to PCBWay using the link in the description for $5 off your first order. A big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and for helping creators and engineers everywhere turn their ideas into reality. In 1997, Apple was in trouble. The clone market had eaten into sales, System 7 was showing its age, and the company desperately needed a modern OS. At the same time, the PowerPC alliance, Apple, IBM and Motorola, was evolving, promising faster and more efficient chips. The 7300 was part of Apple's transitional lineup. A solid but conservative machine that still relied on the same architecture Apple had used since the early 90s. It was an old world ROM Mac, meaning most of the macOS startup code lived in a big physical chip on the motherboard. That detail will become important later. The PowerPC 604E was an impressive piece of silicon for its day. It handled floating point maths and multitasking well, but it ran hot and required large complex motherboards. In benchmarks it traded blows with the Pentium Pro, not bad for 1996, but it was starting to show its limits. Even at 200 MHz, applications like Photoshop could feel sluggish, and this is where the G3 came in. Unlike the 604E, the G3 wasn't an upgrade, it was a completely new architecture, faster, leaner and built to leave its predecessor in the dust. The PowerPC 750, or G3, was Apple's comeback chip. It featured a faster backside cache, a shorter pipeline and better branch prediction. Companies like Sonnet, PowerLogix and newer technologies all jumped at the opportunity to sell G3 upgrade cards to owners of old Macs like the one I have here. These cards plugged right into the CPU daughter card slot and gave the machine a massive boost without replacing the logic board. If your machine has a cache card, this usually needs to be removed or else you might find your system doesn't boot. Then simply install the extension and reboot and you're away to the races. Now these upgrade cards weren't cheap, but were often cheaper than buying a whole new machine. Today, upgrade cards are highly sought after by enthusiasts and command high prices. What we're going to do here is launch Photoshop 5, then open a 3 megapixel image and apply a Gaussian blur with a radius of 10 and see how long it takes to complete. We'll repeat the test, but this time with a 12 megapixel image. Then we'll shut down the machine, swap the processor over and repeat the tests again and compare the difference between processors. We'll also run Speedometer, which does a number of tests in which we'll be able to compare. I don't really know what the numbers mean, but I always go by the mantra of bigger is more better. The first test completes in about 15 seconds. I was a little slow to stop the timer. And now here is the same test but running on the G3. Remember this CPU upgrade is not only twice as fast but has a bigger backside cache. This test completes in around 10 seconds, even with my poor stopwatch abilities. That's a 33% reduction in time, meaning the G3 is 50% faster in this test. So let's try the same test but with the 12 megapixel version of the image. This was taken with my iPhone 17 Pro Max in the high efficiency image format, but then converted in Photoshop into JPEG. It was then saved with the maximum image quality to reduce compression artifacts. The 3 megapixel image is 3 megabytes, whereas the 12 megapixel one is 8 megabytes. 
So just to confirm what's happening in this test is we're opening a 12 megapixel image on the 6F4E processor. We'll then do a Gaussian blur and see how long it takes. And the first thing that's immediately apparent about the two images is how long it takes Photoshop to open. The 3 megapixel image only took a second or two before it opened, however here there's a progress bar. But then again the 12 megapixel image is roughly 4 times the size as the 3 megapixel image in terms of pixels, so the opening speed difference is understandable. I'll speed things up here, watching progress bars crawl across the screen isn't exactly edge of your seat YouTube entertainment. And just over 1 minute and 3 seconds and we're done. Back to the G3, we'll repeat the test again and see how long it takes compared to the 6A4. Immediately the progress bar is moving quicker, not by a wide margin but it is noticeable. Even though the G3 processor itself was fast, a lot of real world performance depends on the system bus. Earlier machines like my 7300 ran on a 50 MHz bus, which limited how quickly the CPU could talk to memory and peripherals. Later G3 systems doubled that to 100 MHz, giving them a big boost in memory bandwidth and overall responsiveness. So whilst both machines might have the same clock speed, the faster bus meant less waiting around for data, and the computer simply felt snappier. Still, upgrading an old system had its perks though. It meant keeping the SCSI and ADB ports, letting you continue using legacy devices that many newer Macs had already left behind. So 45 seconds versus 63, that's an improvement of about 40%. Not bad, but was it worth it? A G3 upgrade card could breathe new life into your Mac, offering a cost-effective performance boost for less than the cost of a new machine. Plus, if you relied on legacy peripherals, it meant you didn't have to upgrade those quite yet. But now over to speedometer. For those of you who are not familiar, it's a benchmarking suite which evaluates various hardware components, including CPU, RAM, hard disk and graphics capabilities, providing a comprehensive performance profile. The results are presented numerically and can be compared across different systems, making it valuable for comparing different models and the impact of hardware upgrades. Luckily, the speedometer tests only take a minute, unlike Geekbench from today, and I like that you can see what it's doing. The 6A4E scored 593. Now I don't know if that's good or bad, but we'll need to remember that number for later. Next, we'll run the same test on the G3 and see what number that generates. Eleven sixteen, almost eleven seventeen. The difference isn't subtle. Where the 6A4E churns away, the G3 just breezes through. But we're not here to look at Photoshop or synthetic benchmarks, are we? What about the operating system? BOS was created by B Incorporated, founded in 1990 by Jean-Louis Gasset, a former Apple executive. He'd grown frustrated with Apple's slow pace of innovation and wanted to build a clean, modern OS, one designed from the ground up for multimedia and parallel processing. BOS was fast, elegant and ahead of its time. It could handle multiple audio and video streams, use per application threading and had a 64-bit journaling file system. It was everything classic macOS wasn't. When Apple went shopping for a next-gen OS in 1996, BOS was on the shortlist. Gasset even demoed it to Apple, but famously he asked for too much money. Apple walked away and bought Next, and the rest is history. But B wasn't done. They decided to release BOS for the PowerPC Macs, specifically the old world models like the 7300. Now here's where things get interesting. When Apple introduced the new world ROM architecture with the iMac G3 in 1998, it completely changed how Macs booted. The old physical ROMs were gone, and in place, a lightweight firmware layer called Open Firmware, which loaded a software ROM file from disk. For Apple's engineers, it was a huge leap forward. Cheaper, more flexible, and easier to update. But for third-party OS developers like B, this was a nightmare. The BOS relied on Apple's old ROM routines for everything, hardware initialization, disk access, and even interrupt handling. To support the new architecture, B needed detailed documentation on Apple's new firmware and chip designs, but Apple refused to share it. After the next acquisition, Apple's priority was building macOS 10 not helping its competitors, so B was effectively locked out. So BOS for PowerPC is effectively frozen in time, compatible only with old world ROM Macs like the 7300 and a few others. 
Oh, and B's own legendary hardware, the B-Box, with its blinking lights. And oh my god, I so want one. But they're rarer than rocking horse poop, and I kind of need both kidneys. That's what makes this upgrade so special. Because the 7300 still uses an old world ROM, BOS boots just fine. The system thinks it's using a 604E, but under the hood it's the 400MHz G3, and it shows the CPU model number in Pulse or about BOS. And the results are amazing. The OS absolutely flies, apps launch super quickly, and multitasking feels years ahead of its time. You can drag windows around whilst audio keeps playing smoothly, something classic macOS couldn't dream of doing. Upgrading this old Mac did more than make it faster. It unlocked an alternate timeline, one where BOS and the PowerPC G3 actually meet. It's a glimpse of what would have happened if Apple had licensed the BOS, or shared those documents. Maybe we'd have seen a dual boot macOS and BOS machine on store shelves. Instead, B Inc pivoted to x86 and eventually faded into history. But here, on this beige beast from 1997, it's alive again. Fast, responsive and oddly futuristic. Proof that even 25 years later there's some magic left in these old Power Macs. Well, if you've made it this far, thanks ever so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.